I'm sitting here today with Annette Schirulf. Um, this conversation we are having uh, today is part of a series of uh, talks we're organizing uh, for Bergen Kunsthal as part of the landmark program during uh, the Corona situation when we can't have uh, such a busy live event program to present uh, talks uh, with artists uh, on our online platforms. Uh, and because of the situation, uh, we thought it's a good idea to focus uh, with a series on artists who live in or around Bergen, who have a presence uh, on uh, the scene in the city in many different roles. Um, and each of these talks has a specific setting. Uh, we ask uh, the artist also to think about a situation in which to have a conversation or presentation. Uh, I maybe first introduce briefly Annette. Uh, she's an artist, writer and curator. Um, studied in Bergen at the uh, National Academy, at that time called Westlands Kunstakademy. Uh, has uh, an artistic practice, often working in print, and we'll talk about that later, what that actually means. Uh, especially woodcut, but across a wide uh, variety of uh, other media too. Drawing, sculpture, artist books and installations. She's often working in collaboration or connection with her sister, Caroline Schirulf, who's also an artist. And she has exhibited uh, widely, nationally and internationally. Um, shows that, that I've seen, for example, uh, Manifesta 4 in Frankfurt in 2002. That's a long time ago. And two exhibitions, uh, participated in two exhibitions in an exhibition space in Berlin that is very dear to me after The Butcher. And, um, uh, has worked also as a curator, uh, ran for many years uh, an exhibition space, by the way, from, 2019, from 1999 to 2007 and was a curator of Momentum, um, uh, the Festival for Contemporary Art in Moss, together with Max Leyden in 2006. She was also the co-founder and editor of the uh, art magazine Kunstjournal in B-Post. Um, with, uh, which produced uh, thematic uh, issues uh, annually, I think, uh, between 2006 and 2015. And uh, we're sitting here today uh, in a summer, uh, complete summer situation. Um, and um, maybe I have to ask, where are we actually sitting today? Yeah, we are in uh uh, on Haugland in uh, Bøvågen, on the island uh, called Radøy, north of Bergen. Yeah, an hour and 15 minutes roughly by car. Yeah. And really interesting, uh, since we're here, we had already just now uh, a little tour through um, uh, over the property. And uh, it used to be a farm and was actually run for uh, many years as a farm by Annette and her husband, which is uh, interesting also as a, a kind of different way of connecting to a landscape. I was uh, very impressed. And uh, there's still gardens and um, a studio building here located on the grounds. Yeah, um, I thought uh, I was interested to talk uh, to you because of uh, a focus on print and uh, what it means to use this uh, specific uh, artistic medium today and in relation to its history. So I wanted to talk a bit about um, a couple of questions um, around uh, the artistic practice to start with. Um, yeah, and especially the choice of woodcut as an artistic medium and uh, its position in uh, current discourse, one could say. Because um, I guess, uh, on the one hand, uh, woodcut seems to be such an old-fashioned or um, a tradi very traditional medium. Mm. Uh, but then uh, they, there has been also um, a couple of artists working with uh, woodcut recently. So what is your, how did you uh, come to, to, to use um, this specific medium? Yes, it was during my education, the, um, you know, when I studied, it was really this postmodern wave of uh, theory uh, coming finally to Norwegian academies um, in the 
very late 80s and early 90s and um, many almost stopped making art because we were sucked up in this in the discussion about the uh, simulacrum or but I found um, this was very interesting and time consuming but I found a print shop where it was totally empty almost uh, very nice to be because I liked um, the carving and the you know the crafty part of the woodcut it, it sort of um, it's resistant and it hurts and it's uh, um, yeah, so it was this double situation of a very theoretical um, climate, in a way, in a, at least in a Norwegian context, and uh, and the need to um, um, do some physical artworks. At least that's how I felt. So it wasn't popular, but it was a, a nice space. I liked the old machines, you know, the the presses and the. I think I'm, I'm probably were attracted also by the tradition, but especially mm. because nobody told me how to do it. You know, I, I didn't have a um, strict uh, printmaking teacher telling me how to do it. So I, I felt that I found it myself, you know, <laughs> and that's... Uh, uh, and then you're not... then you don't feel restricted by tradition. Mm. You just... Uh, um, so may, sometimes I've had visitors in my studio, they see how I work and they say, why do you do it this way? This, this is wrong, but I've done it for uh, yeah, a uh, long time. So it was a very self, uh, a self study. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I I saw that uh, somewhere you, you also quoted like uh, with uh, basically using print as uh, yeah, like uh, something that uh, throws present-day production ethic uh, into relief uh, through the use of an early craft-based uh, based mass medium. So that's an interesting quote because on the one hand what you just said, the, the kind of um, that is actually very hands-on, you do it yourself, you can uh, uh, almost like reinvent the technique by making it, using it, but it also has this uh, that's another tradition uh, as, a, as a mass medium. It's print, so it's something that uh, isn't necessarily made for uh, a unique piece but uh, it's, um, it uh, is connected uh, early on to an idea of um, yeah, the mass medium or, uh, mm. and through that also to information technologies, like uh, how to, to actually uh, make things public. Yeah, that's, that's something I saw more clearly after, after some years, um, because for me the, the starting point was more the, the way woodcut had been used by Edvard Munch or mm. you know the uh, Brücke, the uh, yeah the German yeah, uh, yeah. expressionist and um, uh, I didn't dig into the the history of the mass media as an early mass medium. Of course, it's there, but. Uh, uh, I got very interested in the, in that and also the um, how that could be uh, how you can draw on that uh, tradition. I mean, it's so. Um, I think that is more in a, it, it's an interesting thought more than. A, a real-time issue because uh, um, that was more part of my need to uh, maybe dig for a discourse around mm. the woodcut because I felt that was sort of lacking. Yeah, there's something that you, um, that's quoted as an ongoing project, uh, woodcut as a cultural critique, um, something you do, do in connection or collaboration with um, your sister as a kind of ongoing discursive yeah. framework for your work? Mm -hmm. um, absolutely, and I was also looking for uh, other artists, like you mentioned, that used uh, printmaking or woodcast as a discursive tool because it's, it's not so interesting. I'm not interested in making um, many images you know i'm not so interested in the reproductive uh, t 
acting as a let's say mm -hmm. commercial um, it, it has this side that you can manifold uh, an image and it, it can be sold cheaper you know I like the idea that you can sell art cheaper to more people yeah, yeah. I mean that's a nice aspect yeah but there's also this other aspect with printmaking that people that maybe has given it a low uh, status yeah and not seen as something interesting in itself that it has this commercial side to it or um, and there are as you say a couple of artists not that many but there are uh, absolutely also uh, so because I was looking for uh, to also have a dialogue with uh, more people into that yeah but I mean the, the uh, relationship to the mass medium aspect is also in your work maybe Yes, several levels, but there is you, you often use text, uh, yeah, and sometimes almost like uh, some works you've done in the past um, almost uh, look like posters or they seem yes, to reproduce yes. posters. Yeah, it's true. Um, the Rosa Luxemburg print, for example. Yes. Yeah. Mm, and it's maybe it's a fine line between actually making a poster and using the poster look as a um, uh, statement yeah. uh, and this is also with the text uh, both me and my sister have used a lot of text you know that's um, we think of it as a way to disturb the prettiness in a or to give some resistance mm. uh, but of course you have the um, there is always a um, challenge in the, in, because we in our culture, we, we, uh, well, we say that we are so good at reading images, but when it comes text, we focus on the text. Yeah. So, um, mm, yes. So there is always, uh, but this resistance is, or this, um, uh, what do you call it, a problem, but uh, this is, it goes on being interesting, uh, this. Uh, yeah, it's interesting that you, that you, that you call it like, uh, basically like, a, like a, a way of messing up an image, because um, yeah, I guess uh, I almost thought like um, some of the works also you, you use um, very clearly recognizable things in works like mm. um, the way that animals are used for example who uh, have a very prominent place in iconog iconography and um, they also it's all things it's th things that um, people can discover uh, or recognize uh, there's often people or houses so basically um, things that uh, really relate very closely to everyday mm. experiences mm. and um, so to me that had uh, the text was also like um, a way of um, maybe playing or um, with meaning, but also being very uh, conscious about um, using meaning in a quite direct way, which has again to do with maybe a certain tradition of um, printmaking and posters that... Um, um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's true. We, are, we have been researching posted traditions, for instance, or um, uh, and maybe um, and used, let's say, fonts that are. Um, or for a while, I used fonts that were um, that I picked from old old material. But yeah. um, but it's um it's not. Uh, I, tr I try to combine text and image in a way that it doesn't really have a meaning, but it, it's um, uh, so it's not a poster that tells yeah. you what um, a poster should. Yeah, but yeah. still, uh, the language is so strong; it often overruled. Uh, uh, you know, even if you play with it, the poster. Um, matrix or what to call it is so strong that it, it feels like it has a very yeah. political uh, um, message even if it doesn't you know yeah, because yeah, yeah. the 
the form is so strong in itself. Yeah. That's my experience now. Yeah. Yeah, true. Uh, And I, and I, li I like that, that um, actually the, the kind of, uh, it's a very conscious dealing with um, a kind of uh, tradition of a mass medium without necessarily being a, being a mass medium today. It's like, I mean, yeah, I guess if we, if we talk about uh, a function that poster once had, it's, um, I don't know, Instagram or uh, mm. um, other websites are nowadays probably um, much more <laughs> effective. Mm. But, um, um, there is still this, we, we, we know a kind of visual language and um, that's interesting. And uh, uh, I mean, yeah, we talked a bit like also before about some traditions like Honoré Dumier who uh, introduced, um, uh, who I, I guess he, he's important for that, uh, for a, a breaking of these hierarchies of um, that printmaking was always the kind of lowest medium in the academic um, hierarchy of um, art mediums. And he was focusing so much on um, printmaking that he kind of um, became mostly known for uh, prints. And um, he also focused on uh, yeah, reproducible images, magazines, uh, with a very political meaning. But um, actually thinking now about prints, somebody who's for me, um, uh, super important, and um, I have to think about uh, him as a as a person in relation to to uh, printmaking. Uh, immediately is uh, Hab Grieshaber. Uh, uh, do you know him? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I mean, who's who's um, in in yeah? He's uh, um, actually wrote down his his uh, yeah born ninety nine died in 1981 and uh, he uh, participated two times in Documenta so he was also uh, a prominent artist of his time but he was incredibly popular uh, when I remember growing up um, we had prints at home and lots of parents of mm. uh, friends also had prints at home and um, there was a retrospective in 1979 uh, just before his death and um, everybody had that book at home so and um, it was and that's interesting because um, it, it, it's, uh, it's an artist who became so much uh, part of um, uh, a kind of general knowledge of a specific time, a kind of leftist, alternative, liberal mm. milieu mm. of the yeah, 70s and 80s. But it also connected to um, what he did actually. He, so he, he was kind of politically active, uh, drew on uh, religious iconography, interestingly enough, often with angels or... Um, very strong visual forms, actually often quite abstract also. Um, and uh, he's, f for me, in a way, an interesting uh, uh, object of study, maybe, of um, a kind of uh, connection between um, art and a wider public sphere and political discourse, very typical of a time, but also really interesting for uh, a moment in which art becomes really public. And that, for me, is... Um, somehow really connected to a, a kind of potential of, of printmaking. Mm. And uh, maybe also what you said, that it's actually not so... It's less expensive than uh, a painting, of course. Yeah, not, I mean, maybe not in an exactly similar way that him, but yeah. there has been times in, through the 60s and 70s, also in Norway, where especially the silk screen uh, used by groups like Gras and, you know, um, um, really spreading out uh, the works and uh, in a much more um, uh, direct political way, I would say. Yeah. So it's... Um, mm, but our times now are not exactly those. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, so it's... Um, but I think it it's a very it makes uh, printmaking um, um, more interesting to look into this. And he also did all these works with. I mean, I actually know about him through uh, uh, being curious about Andrea Butner's uh, work, yeah. and because she uh, was interested in or used him in her work, I referred to him. I 
start reading about him. And he also did this, um, he did, uh, yeah, he was sociable or he did works with people and, you know, um, but for me that social energy goes into the teaching and, and not so mm. much, um, or at least anymore, I'm, I actually like to be alone. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, because you, you sort of need, um, oh yeah. um, uh, yeah, I guess I'm, um, um, through my life I've been very sociable, but then I've moved more and more towards the uh, contemplative lifestyle, maybe. Mm. Yeah. So I, I sit in the woods. Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's. I mean, uh, maybe too early to say, but we yeah we had a look at the studio and uh, uh, saw some works which uh, I guess reflect on that also a bit like a kind of uh, experience of nature and dealing with uh, nature and uh, our relationship as a as a topic. Mm. Yeah. Um, now that. that I'm actually, do, do you follow what's happening now with um, like print culture in, uh, there's kind of this trend of risograph um, and uh, initiatives in Bergen, like Pamphlet, for mm -hmm. example, who, mm -hmm. and they produce, for example, uh, now a couple of um, posters that have been used um, in the, in support of Black Lives Matter. And uh, so they ha yeah, are hanging great. around. Mm -hmm. um, Bergen now, and that was kind of. I also noticed that this is kind of um, this very direct uh, use of um, um, print for uh, political purposes, mm -hmm. and, uh, and also I'll, interesting. I, I used to be very interested in this, you know, when I uh, when I made this uh, window gallery together mm. with uh, Ingrid Bergen. In the, um, I was really interested in the meeting point with the people in the. Uh, just on the pavement yeah. and not uh, so much uh, yeah to focus just on the inside of the white cube and um, um, so that period I guess was the most um, I know uh, that it because people I still meet people who tell me experiences from that I know it meets people yeah. when it's outdoor like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I actually also heard about the gallery space uh, uh, long before I knew uh, that it was you who was uh, running it and before I knew um, how to figure out who actually exhibited there. But um, I heard it also as a kind of uh, people remembering that those windows were used um, uh, for art exhibitions. Um, that's yeah, just around the corner of yeah, Kunsthallen yes. at uh, what's now described as the Kunstgarte yeah. uh, in a space that's, um, what is it actually, it's a pump building yeah, or something. Yeah, it is. And it was always a compromise because it is used for other things, but uh, we could only rent the windows. Yeah. So. But that created this nice situation that the, the gallery was basically just the windows, so mm. it was this um, also, um, yeah, this meeting of uh, people who not necessarily look for art and uh, the artworks that were specifically made for this very um, special situation. Yeah, very public. You yeah. had to compete with uh, anything and you think uh, all the stuff going on and you, you, I think you, it was a very interesting uh, uh, space to work with. Yeah. Um, to see all the different uh, solutions artists came up yeah, with. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then just to say again, so it was called By the Way, the gallery, and ran from eight years basically, from 1999 to 2007. And I looked to the list of artists, it's um, also like uh, really interesting as a kind of, yeah, it's a lot of artists that are still working and uh, kind of important in, in Bergen and um, Different generations, Rita Mahauk, Trine Lise Nedras, uh, then Gada Aida Einerson and Matthias Faltbacken, who studied in Bergen. Uh, Elsebeth Ralf, together with her two sons, uh, Sixten and Espen, who are both architects, also interesting. And yeah, Endre Alrust, 
August. Mm. Uh, just a couple of names, mm. but it's kind of really impressive that um, this, uh, uh, the exhibition history of that um, place. Yeah, but, you know, I was, um, um, you know, Bergen has, uh, has had its ups and downs in the uh, whole activities. And uh, at that time, when we started it, I was really, no, it, no we need something new. No, it, no we need something to happen mm -hmm. here because something had been there and it's put down. And, you know, the, so uh, a lot of energy was put into that gallery so it and that also when you put a lot of energy you get also mm. back so it's uh, yeah it was great it was really I missed it very much uh, when it was finally put down it uh, because it was uh, part of my uh, rhythm for um, so many years and having a small kid i could i could not have a gallery where i could sit anyway mm. so it was a uh, perfect uh, <laughs> practical yeah <laughs> yeah it was yeah. practical of course everything is yeah, also yeah. practical i mean it's it has a practical side yeah and you have to you can be ambitious uh, on a stamp on a tiny stamp it, that's possible yeah. Was there or ambitious, yeah. or you know, you can do things even in a, with limitations. Yeah. But it was a good location. It's perfect uh, location. Yeah. But you know, the location was also time to negotiate. And um, luckily, there was a poet that also had a job in the Baden Commune that in that section, mm. because you know the. Yeah. Well, anyway, I'll, I won't go into that. But yeah. uh, no. But I, I thought it was interesting to actually uh, realize the connection between yeah this kind of uh, window situation of uh, the exhibition space or the, the exhibition program and uh, your own artistic practice. That it's really also about these kind of interfaces between um, viewer and um, artist. This kind of question of like how does something get public or is seen, which in your own work is much more about um, maybe related to the medium or uh, the way that images and texts are used. Um, and um, in the gallery, of course, um, as a kind of organizational, institutional form, this specific uh, gallery that just consisted out of windows. Um, and then um, maybe a work that's kind of um, of yours that uh, sits um, also connects that you, you made also a couple of artworks in public space and you're actually currently working on a new one in a, a, a commission, a building commission, not necessarily mm. classic public space. But um, so it's also like a strand in your work that um, yeah, commissions for uh, public spaces or buildings and uh, yeah, the the a work called Wie Wei Wiesere? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, at that was a good, I have to restart the camera. That was a good place to... Uh, I wanted to talk also about uh, a public artwork uh, you made um, because it uh, somehow adds maybe to the, to the discussion around um, your uh, print work and uh, the gallery that you ran. Um, a public work made for um, a wall at Georg Johansen's Plus um, called Wey Wiesere. And I was interested in that because it's um, almost a bit like, I mean, it's, it's again like it's you're using text and this uh, it's quotes by Georg Johansen. Um, but it uh, activates a space as a place for reading. And I had to think about wall newspapers and uh, these very simple uh, ways to to uh, use um, space for reading and uh, as, as a place for information, basically. What was the story yeah. of that? Uh, yeah, my, work? me and uh, my sister Carolina, we uh, we got this commission to refurbish. I mean, it's already called Georg Johansson's Plus, mm. and it's been uh, 
um, a piece there from before, highlighting some of his quotes uh, with the um, paint, but the paint was, um, you know, after years, it needs redo, or they wanted to redo it and, um, or refurbish it. And we, oh, we love, uh, we really love uh, Georg Hansen. Uh, he was, he is, he's so easy quotable. Um, and we thought of how to um, present the quotes and we ended with the uh, road signs and we commissioned road signs by those, by those who make the road signs mm. in Bergen. So the, again the form, the matrix are you call it a matrix? <laughs> you know, the form yeah. is uh, used. I uh, know we know it. We are not uh, used to read it, but the content inside is uh, different than a street name. So it's this uh, uh, um, I would like to combine the and they are yeah they even uh, shine up in the dark with, ah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> that is reflective material. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. That's beautiful. And, um, yeah, but this, this work was made in close um, uh, collaboration with um, the trust or the committee that take care of uh, his work and mm. especially what quotes to use. So, so our job was more the, to find a visual, okay, yeah. uh, visual yeah. uh, solution or the artistic solution. Yeah. And you know, it should also be able to take the weather and it's all these things you have to think about uh, outside, yeah. Yeah, and it needs to, uh, public artworks uh, have come with a lot of uh, conditions. It needs to be able to uh, stay in good shape for a longer period of time. Yeah, in this, yeah. In this case, there was no... Uh, uh, what can I say, freedom to provoke. <laughs> but the, in the, the window gallery, there was freedom to provoke, you know? Yeah. So you have this, or let's say different kind of negotiations, different types of negotiations uh, with different kinds of public work. You, if something is temporary, you can do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, other stuff than something that is made to last, but it's uh, both are, Interesting, it's always a negotiation, it's just a, the framework is slightly different in different yeah. situations. We missed one bit, which uh, there would have been a good chance to talk about it before, uh, but I want to <laughs> ask about it anyways, which uh, is the exhibition at uh, Kunsthallen um, in 2012, uh, a show without a title, just the artist names, um, but focusing very Closely on, uh, I mean, I guess really woodcut. Uh, op, no, Matthew no, Brennan. Matthew Brennan yeah, doesn't. He's, that's yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it was, you know, we got the option actually from when we were invited by Solvay and Steiner, we, we got the option if we wanted to fill the hole uh, oh. ourselves or invite to a dialogue and uh, suggest artists. Mm. And in this time, uh, we were very much. We, we wanted to uh, add to the printmaking discourse or, you know, the, so yeah. it, was a, it was a perfect situation to be able to gather some of um, some people who work with prints, even mostly with cut, as you say, but we also very much like Matthew Brand's yeah. uh, combination of text and image. And, yeah, yeah. Um, That's, he's using, skill, is it silk Yeah, it, and uh, also, uh, yeah. Very, I think he also have a very skilled letterpress uh, guy yeah, to yeah. Uh, to work with. And we had to move to escape the shadow, um, but we were just talking about um, an exhibition at Bergen Kunsthal in 2012, um, showing um, Matthew Brennan, Andrea Büttner, Annette Schirulf, Caroline Schirulf, and Thomas Kilper. And actually, uh, you mentioned that. Uh, 
the exhibition was um, developed in dialogue with you, um, selecting other artists to complement or show together with you, basically. Yeah, that was yeah. very... Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah, that was the starting point, but then uh, it was, um, I mean, we didn't, we were not um, curators or anything, it was a more, uh, you know, um, uh, asking for the artists we wanted, and mm. then they did <laughs> all the dialogue, because we just had to focus on uh, making the works then, because we made everything new for that exhibition in quite short uh, time. Mm. Um, yeah, and we had some, um, we had a very nice, Matthew Brennan, for instance, he came out here and it was very, you know, it's it's nice um, when you live in um, a place like Bergen, you also need uh, some visitors. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> you know, we don't, um, uh, let's say compared to him who lives in New York, there's all these people, um, um, you know, another, yeah, it's it's good that a, a city like Bergen needs a good airport, yeah. so that people can actually uh, comfortably fly in, and uh, it's possible to leave once in a while. Yeah, I think that's you know I've lived in Bergen a long time, yeah. or in the Bergen area, and I think it, um, it's such a small town, but it still has this flow of people, and that makes it interesting. So it's yeah. it's. Uh, I only wish sometimes it was even a bigger art museum or, uh, you know, I would like to see even more art in live. Mm. Uh, that's what I envy in the really big cities. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, but what was interesting about um, the, the print show was also the, the different ways in which artists use print. I just had to think, I mean, we talked briefly about Andrea Büttner. Um, but Thomas Kilper, for example, who's making these um, massive uh, print projects, which are using whole buildings mm. to, as, as ways mm -hmm. to create woodcuts. Yeah. It's also interesting that, uh, yeah, to show the uh, yeah from the intimate. Yeah. You know, it can be from the or from the intimate to the very. Uh, yeah. um, large, what they call monumental yeah, yeah. in a way. Uh, so it was this, uh, uh, I, I mean, I also like prints being shown in the book format. You know, it yeah. has, uh, um, yeah. it's, a, it's a very important part of uh, a discussion around print actually. I mean, historically and I think still today is um, talking about um, books, for example, and uh, uh, yeah, there was one publication I uh, saw uh, you, um, that you made um, printmaking and placemaking, which is an interesting uh, title because it deals with two different uh, moments. Like printmaking usually is something that is meant as a moment of distribution, and yeah, placemaking is something that's very much about a specific location. Mm. And uh, yeah, you brought a couple of books, and um, just uh, maybe that's. Um, a good uh, topic to close, like the, the, yeah. the role of um, books in your work. Yeah, it's actually, it's my husband that um, um, are doing the, the design and the printing of this on, you know, the, this is printed by copy machine. So um, it's more the nowadays printing tool. Yeah. Um, but it's, and we have made, uh, he's made uh, more than me, but we, it's, the, it's a collaboration. We have a publishing house together that are sort of, uh, has its basis here on the island. And we um, visit um, artist book fair and, mm -hmm. um, or um, spread them um, to different bookstores. But it's also a, a yeah, so it has a, a different kind of distribution that's um, even easier than print, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so placemaking, I think it's very important in my practice as in my life. I, I you know, like, like the things that I worked with, uh, also besides my art, with the, the magazine Kunstjournalen or the gallery, both based in Bergen, it's also, um, it's very conscious about the place making, reaching out, but still making something in, mm. um, and I think maybe it's a reaction to the very globalness of the art uh, world. And um, um, that you want to, um, um, I like to be on the fringes, so to say, but it's, it's, uh, it gives you also room to uh, create the institution and not just the product or mm. what they call it. <laughs> you know, it's, um, or, or to um, uh, contribute on different um, levels. Um, or maybe that's just a result of a uh, I'm very aware of the context I'm in. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I guess in Bergen, it's like Bergen has a size in which uh, it's possible to start something and it becomes actually important, or uh, it has a legacy and it draws people. It means something for um, people who participate, either as um, active participants or as audience or so. So that's um, actually a. Um, I guess uh, a nice thing of about the the size of the city, but still, it's kind of. Um, I mean, Bergen is a very important, uh, larger uh, city in the uh, Norwegian context, at least. And yeah. uh, yes, but okay, let's. Uh, you know, I live with a writer, and uh, for the writers who write in Norwegian, I can very much uh, see that they have a um, milieu for their art. Uh, which is not the same as um, the fine art are more um, globalized. Yeah. So there is differences in uh, yeah. in the cultures of art, and um, and I think this has uh, fueled some interest in me, not just to work on my own art, but also uh, work on the. Yeah. Uh, Milieu <laughs> or the yeah surroundings. How how do you work from here? Is there something you because this is very um, specific or special? I, mean, I mentioned uh, in the beginning um, the aspect that uh, this was actually a functional farm not too long ago. Mm. Uh, it's different now, but still it's. Um, uh, not just the Dilly, it also has a very different relationship to, to, to nature and um, maybe um, uh, even much less of a kind of artistic context. How do you, how do you work with this? Um? I think that's also a part of the placemaking and that, that's... Um, um, mm. You know, I guess I have this hero, uh, you know, Toro, that said that uh, I uh, haven't traveled. Uh, no, I've traveled a lot in Concord, which is a very, very mm. small town. Um, and this, um, the thing that uh, I walk the same walk every day, it's just towards the marshland. And it's, even if I take this very um, one hour walk, it's always something new happening because you look at the details. I think I'm more and more interested in the subtle changes and and that there is a world just in you know in a square uh, centimeter in the earth down here it's uh, it's all kinds of beetles and mm. hey. <laughs> oops <laughs> so it's um you know, you can explore. There's so many uh, ways to explore. It's not just this uh, through airports. It's also through uh, uh, looking closer. Looking closer. I guess yeah. that's the that's my 
Golo.